Hello and welcome to the first episode of Learning Rust with Git Oxide. Git Oxide is this idiomatic, lean, fast, safe, and pure Rust implementation of Git, or in other words, pure awesomeness. And um, my name is Sebastian. I'm your host, and with me is my honorable friend, Sidney. Hi, Sid. Hi. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Welcome on the show. I always want to say that. <laughs> Then let's dig right in to, yeah, I think, the essence of Rust and the kind of key feature that makes Rust the language that I want to implement Gedoxide in. Because I've tried many times. I tried it in Python. It did not work. I tried it in Go. It did not work. I didn't try it for long, fortunately. And I tried it in C++. It also did not work. Um, just because I can't do it, I'm not, I'm just not, you know, good enough for this. I'm just a human, like uh, most people in this world, I suppose. And I need proper tooling to, to do this kind of thing, to do Git. And Rust has this thing that it calls ownership and borrowing. And that is something that, you know, everybody now wants to have because it gives you this, this, this memory safety thing. And it's this incredible property that if you have it, you have a ton of less bugs in your code or in your programs by default. And that's what you want. Uh, and that is not only in multi-threaded applications, it's in single-threaded applications, uh, the same thing. And I think it makes sense to try to look at what this ownership borrowing thing does for us in a program. Uh, that is so different and so desirable, let's say. Okay. So this is this is some memory or some bytes that I laid out from left to right. Every X is a byte, let's say, some memory location. These ones here, I painted them in because they could be something special. They could be our, our objects. Maybe if we make it this, it's a bit more obvious. So that's the thing we're interested in. And what do you think now is, is safe to do with this memory? Like, what can I do with this memory without a program ever having an issue later? I guess you can read it. I can read it. Oh, yeah, I should probably hide this side by here, which <laughs> <laughs> gives away a bunch of things. Um, that is true. Let's unhide this arrow that indicates that somebody is currently reading Ah, yeah, let's just let it read this specific byte here, this this one zero byte we, we read. Okay, so how many of these readers can I have without stuff breaking? I would say probably infinite uh, or as many as the computer can handle probably, um, but there shouldn't be anything wrong with multiple people accessing it. This one time when you should have read the sidebar, of course, you can only have two, two readers. That's the only safe thing. <laughs> it's binary, one or two. Ah. Okay. Yeah, but you're right, of course. Infinite readers, because as long as your program state, which is this bunch of bytes, essentially, is not changed, nothing can ever go wrong, right? So any amount of readers is possible at any time, concurrently, whatever, doesn't matter, uh, will work. Fine. So why can't we have programs that only read stuff? That's just not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> These programs are boring, right? They don't do anything. I mean, they do something. They display stuff. But, yeah. Stuff has to come from somewhere. Yeah, where's that, where's that stuff coming from? Somebody has to write that stuff in at some point. And then what happens? Okay, so what happens now as we add a writer to this thing, right? So now we have two readers reading this and a writer writing it. And let's just say that this, this one is now reading a, a zero here. This reader just reads, gets a zero. Now the writer comes and changes this byte to a one. These X's are uninitialized, let's say. And now this reader comes 
and reads the one. And let's just say that at the end of this, these two reads, they have been triggered by my application. And how is my application gonna like that one time it sees a zero and one time it sees a one, sees a one, and now its worldview is inconsistent. And inconsistent worldviews and applications, they are no fun. Uh, they can cause these logic bugs that are hard to trace down. They can cause all kinds of issues. Usually the program crashes <laughs> now, that's the good part, or later, that's the not so good part, or something very else. And of course, we can imagine all kinds of things happening with this byte. You can write it to something that is valid for the program, but still inconsistent, or you can outright uh, delete this memory. Now it's uninitialized and, oh, it's a world of pain that you may enter. And funnily enough, like, like this writer, does it have to come from another thread? Does it have to be kind of, you know, multi-threading stuff that we can just avoid, right? We don't need that. We just don't use multiple threads, single threaded forever. Is that a way to work around this? Not really. Okay, not really. But if there's a single thread, yeah, but there isn't really a single thread, right? Because these modern operating systems, they time slice. No, wait, they don't time. No, this, how can it be possible that somebody writes between the reads? Must be the same application then, huh? Must be something like this. Like the same application causes the write. So first we read this, then the code in the application writes something and then read something else. Uh, or read something that is now an X, which is kind of bad. And you might say, how can that happen in a single threaded application? And then you remember this code that says, um, can, I, can, I, can I write this here? Can I write some code? Uh, maybe I can write some code. Then you remember code that says things like, let's have a vector. Um, with a bunch of things there and then we create an iterator over the vector and then we push something to the vector and then we iterate so for item in iterator oop, in iterator print my items um, oops like this. So this is the kind of program that reads some memory or that initializes a reader of memory, then changes the memory and then tries to read the memory. And this change of memory is the thing that people easily forget, right? Because in C++ you can do that easily. But I mean, as a prime example of ownership and borrowing, what does Rust say? I mean, first of all, IntelliJ tells you, listen, you cannot borrow an immutable local variable V as mutable because in Rust, like everything by default is immutable. And why is everything immutable in Rust? Because it's safe. Yes, <laughs> because that's the only safe default. That's what you want. You want immutable things. You don't ever want to want changes in your program and Rust does this by default. So I can now press all return. By the way, this is IntelliJ here with the Rust plugin. It's the community edition, it's the free edition. That's how I do Rust best, but Visual Studio Code with the Rust language server is also pretty neat and gets better by the day, literally. So I'm always looking at, at this one too. But right now I'm on IntelliJ, but hopefully one day, maybe one little more Visual Studio Code. Okay, so now as I used code intelligence to just do what's right here, I'm now able to allow to mutate that vector and so I can push to it. And IntelliJ seems happy about that, but IntelliJ does not have a borrow checker. So it can't really, it doesn't really simulate this. You can turn that on, but I have turned it off. So uh, let's turn that on because I think that could help us a lot here in seeing things right away. Let's see if I can find that setting quickly. 
run external linter to analyze code on the fly. Yes, that's the one. Okay, does it do that now? Do I have to change something for it to do that? Oh, no. Okay. I don't see anything, let's compile it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Okay, there we go. And now it highlights it. Okay. Ah, because it was running in the background. It, yeah, it just took a while, apparently. Yeah, that's another thing. Rust can take a long time to compile. But it's okay. So here we go. What do we see here? In line three, we have this immutable borrow. And then we want to borrow it mutably to change it. While there is an immutable borrow that is later used. So one way to fix it, right? Would be to do what? Like there are two ways, I think. But what would be one way? Let's focus on the is later used here. Let's fix the later used thing. Oh, I don't hear you. Why don't I hear you? Sorry. So you would just reverse the order, basically. First print, then push. Okay. And the red squiggly line is done and it prints it zero. Sign. Yeah, it works. But in C or C++, it would have potentially accessed uninitialized memory because that vector would have reallocated memory and that might have moved the memory around and that's bad. In Rust, you can't do that. I mean, you literally can't do it. Not even in... Yeah, let's not talk about unsafe code just yet. And that's that's the ownership. Uh, that that's mutability and immutability in a nutshell. But ownership plays a role in this. All right. So here we have this vector that allows us to exemplify exactly that. And that's really it. So the rest of the session we can actually spend to look into this and understand this ownership and borrowing a bit better which ultimately just assures that our programs adhere to this rule that as long as you have readers, there will be no writer. And if you have a writer, you only have one and you have no readers. And that's it. That's the rule. That's all. And enforcing this at compile time is the key to writing awesome code that really, once it compiles, it, yeah, it may have logic bugs because, you know, uh, that still is possible. It could have deadlocks too, because that is depending on the protocol and interactions and so on. Um, but it will not have these weird memory safety issues that crush your program sometime later. And it also allows you to multi-thread your program without fear of weird stuff happening because this is enforced and there's no way around it. There's ways around it. But <laughs> let's say in lesson 1050, maybe we, we look at this. <laughs> All right, cool. So I think with this, we can close that one down and totally not save this beauty of a schematic and instead see if he can trigger this borrowing uh, a bit more. Oh yeah, by the way, also what I set up here is a way for us to keep these messages around. So what should be possible here is to copy this and we say, yes, this don't, doesn't compile, but that's fine because we want to make this available to everybody who looks into this. So each on each step, we should be able to um, save this. Let's create a folder that is fail or called fail and call this vec push rs. Okay, all we, have, all we have to do is put this in here. It's not part of the 
um, Rust project here. We didn't talk about cargo at all, but that's okay. Um, maybe one day, or you will pick it up as we go, uh, because I think you will. Cargo is quite easy to use. So however, this setup here allows us to say, we want to keep this for later and have a compile fail here for a file that isn't fail, like, like push. And now as I run my tests, oh, this should come out as exactly that, a compile fail. This is now main that is failing. Let's try that again. Let's test the ownership as well instead of compiling that. Um, it's still compiling main. Did I not just, I deleted the wrong thing that explains. Let's try that. <laughs> Okay, and now you see that indeed this check failed and it records the failure and if that changes it can also error out and so on, but at least it's a way to kind of keep our assertions here. And it's pretty cool, so you can actually test for compiler fails. Why when would you ever do that? <laughs> when would you ever do that? Actually there you can write uh, macros that generate code on the fly. And this error, error handling logic in macros, they have to create compile errors. And to test that, you have this try build create, um, which is like a library that you can use. Uh, it's specified here in our, in our dev dependencies, because these are for testing and not for our program. And it's made specifically for this. And I thought it could be useful here to just keep track of what we have and our intermediate states. And as you can see, it recorded the error output here. And if that changes, then it should tell you that something changed and you have to reapprove the, the error. We don't probably run into this here. It's really just for safekeeping. Okay, cool. Cool. This is something that German teenagers said around 2005. So um, now what about another way of triggering the borrow checker? What about something as crazy as this? Let's say X is 42 and let Y be X. And now can we, or yeah, I don't wanna go too deep into this. Let's just try things. Experiment a little. Now print print x. So what I would think happens here is that because it has this ownership thing, now this forty two is owned by the binding is bound to x, and as I assign x or as I rebind x to y the ownership of that number 42 goes into Y. So X should be kind of empty and I shouldn't be able to print it anymore. But then again, Makes sense. then again, it does work. I can, I should probably run this and not run the test. So it doesn't have a problem with this at all. Okay. I take, I just take it like this. Maybe there's maybe maybe these primitive types they're too simple. Maybe they're not really taking part of this ownership and borrowing thing, or at least ownership. Hmm, I don't know. Let's try something else. Let's try a string. Hello. No, everything has to be good oxide here. Okay, let's, assign, let's reassign this. And still no problem. So interesting. This just works. So these also don't get 
you know, you can just do what what you want with that. Apparently, no problem. Okay. Is it because we're not modifying Y in any way, so it kind of knows that it's only sure. a read? Sure. So let's modify it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing is, we can't really this iterator before it was kind of binding the vector, right? It was borrowing. It said, "I have an immutable borrow to the vector." So maybe we should try to borrow. Uh, and then we have to change something, true. So we have to borrow x and change, try to change x later. So let's call this xb for x borrowed. So how do you borrow things? Let's go back to 42. And I can tell you that you borrow things with the ampersand. So this creates a borrowed x. So if I now wanted to change x, something else I would have to make it mutable first and now I want to use the borrow before that I wanted to use the iterator and that's exactly what this borrow here is and now we see exactly the same thing cool borrow curse here and later it's used and Reordering the statements will fix it. Okay, so we can reproduce this with something very simple and no memory allocation needed here. Interesting. It's really about somebody being able to read a memory address that is later written by the same application while somebody has the potential to read it. Like, look at this. Rust could allow that. Russ could just say, hey, then I print five, right? Like, why not print five? Why be so annoyed by that? And Russ said, well, we order stuff. Now I print five. And that's how it works with Rust. It forces you to actually improve your code because why would you, why would you do that if your intention is to print five? Um, why not just do your borrow later if you really need it? Because then it has the value that you expect it to have and not just something that is kind of implicitly happening. So again, as annoying the borrow checker might be sometimes, it actually makes code better. Hmm. And I assume it would catch this in the same way if it weren't just a line below, but a hidden in some sub function or subroutine or whatever. Um, I think that's where it really shines, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it. I mean, it does it consistently. Otherwise, it's. I think it's a grave bug that uh, should be reported. So far, uh, there have been some interesting bugs around this with cycles in reference counted uh, pointers, um, and I think it's still there because you can't really fix it. But uh, it's very strange code that you see there that kind of may be unsafe. But it's, I think it's still possible, yes. So even Rust can fully, fully help you in every way, but the code you write usually uh, doesn't pass the borrow check if it's unsafe. Okay, cool. Now, how, yeah, let's write some function here. You said there should be a way to even trigger this when using functions. Okay, so what about an add one function that gets a number? Add one in place that gets a number n and adds one to it. Okay. And what's the issue now here? Yeah. Cannot assign twice to a mutable variable. What? What is this even? It's a bit. Either you or I, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so. Should, should I or should I not stop writing git oxide right now if I can't do this? Um, 
Maybe I just faked it, but I actually didn't. <laughs> okay. It's interesting that that this is the error that uh, IntelliJ gives us. Let's let's see what happens if I if I compile that. Aha. Okay. Binary assignment cannot be applied to type of a borrowed MUT thirty two by a reference to a mutable um, unsigned integer that is 32 bits wide. So what it can do is to do this on the underlying integer itself, which you can get if you dereference it. So if you dereference it with this asterisk, then it will work. And that's the thing about the compiler, right? Like these typical errors that are kind of weird if you see them the first time, right? Because I wouldn't know what the problem is here because it seems fine. I would expect it to work, but it doesn't. But these common things, it just tells you what to do. And as we do this, it does actually work. Okay, so let's clean this up a little. Let's keep printing. Let's keep printing X and maybe add one in place. So we start out with 42 and then I would expect it to be 43. Let's see if that's the case. How do I pass, how do I pass this now? Hmm, what's the syntax? I'm expecting a reference, so I would say and percent X. All right, and percent X and these squiggly lines again. Oh, really, Rust is so frustrating. So just compile. <laughs> Okay, diff is immutability. Oh, so you so you need to redeclare it as a mutable reference, although the actual value is already mutable. Yeah, interesting, huh? So that's a mutable binding to X, but now from that I want to take a mutable reference. Okay, so let's just copy this mutt here then. Okay, it's still squiggly. Okay, come on. Cannot borrow as mutable. Consider changing this to be mutable. So it wants to have mutt in both places. Oh, so wordy. Really, I don't really want to write Rust anymore. I'd rather want to write JavaScript, you know, more freedom. Freedom, woo. And now it prints 43 as expected. Okay. So Nothing with the, I mean, it, it's just about mutability. So maybe this session should not be about ownership and borrowing. It should also include mutability a bit because I think it's all about mutability. It's about being read only or being writable. And that can, that triggers the whole borrowing, borrow checking thing because without mutability, everything's safe and happy. So maybe that makes sense. Maybe it's kind of implied, but it's good to speak it out. This mutt. When you see mutt in a program, then squiggly lines appear. <laughs> I think that's something we, we definitely learn here. Okay. I guess it makes sense. Uh, just to just from reading it, you know exactly what's going on. Right? Everything, you know exactly where it's mutable. Um, yes. And I guess that's already very helpful just for, just for understanding what's going on. That's true. Because we are forced to say, this is mutable. Really, this is now mutable. Come on. Uh, it can't just, it's not implied, it's very explicit. And indeed that adds to readability. So it's interesting here as well that we don't do any kind of type declaration, right? It's just X is 42 and it somehow appears to be a U32. Like, like why? I don't say this is unsigned. I can make a, make a signed here and then, oh, squiggly lines. The trade neg is not implemented for U32. Interesting. Okay. Perfect. What what's a trait anyway? Oh, we, we jumped to we jumped around, but anyway, what's a trait? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm guessing it's something that belongs to a certain type, right? Like something it can do. Um, yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, trade is literally a trait of something it's uh, i mean i don't yeah. know is there other can i can i use some translation feature synonym 
Thesaurus um, that I can bring up. Yeah, I guess it's not a capability that an, a negative or that U32 has, it can't be negative, which does make sense. And it's interesting that it's so hell bent on making this a U32 anyway. Um, but apparently by using it as U32, it becomes U32. And my negative, my indication of it being negative here doesn't really change that, um, which seems fair enough. Uh, what about me telling that it's supposed to be an I32? So now the squiggly, squiggly line moves. Because now it, it just, you know, I've declared the type, I've declared my intent clearly here, and now these types are just incompatible. Huh? So I want an immutable reference to, an U, to a U32, but got an I32. Huh? And here it spells it out for us, so makes sense. And without... So is U32 what it defaults to, or is that just, it can infer that because you're passing it into the function? Huh. I mean, we don't really know just now. Huh? We can just assume it's because it infers it and that sets the type. Mm. Um, maybe we can find out. So what if I do this and then I say x plus plus equal 10? So is that still clear to it? It still prints 52. Okay. But it could still be, I don't know what it is. Is it unsigned? Is it signed? Can I need, Can I add a negative value here? It still works. So we don't really know what kind of type that is that it apparently has created, right? So what seems to, there seems to be some default typing going on here. What's the type? How can I find out the type? Okay. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's play with this a bit more because there's fun ways to declare also that we want a mutable reference here because we could also do like like the, the type of this x is entirely inferred right now and we know we want we want to borrow it later mutably so why not do this right away can we do this yep and now apparently i don't need to make this mutable anymore okay so that works too and now this binding is permanently to a mutable borrow of 42. Right. And I still did not declare any kind of type here that I want. So what if I spell it out? What if I say I want a U32 here? Okay, so now it has two squiggly lines because it wanted a 32, but found a mutable integer. And I could remove this borrow here, which is this part, that's the borrow. So now I would say this 42 is gonna be a use 32 by that means. Remember we had this other way of specifying it like this by suffix, same thing. But now we have it, we have our type explicitly declared here. But there's no way to say I want it to be a borrow, a mutable borrow of a U32 without actually borrowing it. But this is now the fully declared type. Now it's fully explicit without any type inference, so to say. And that's what, what happens under the hood. And interesting here is I think also that this integer thingy. This is Rust's way of telling you that it could not infer the actual type of that integer because it doesn't have enough information from the context. Maybe it could, right? But uh, it doesn't. Okay. And that's what you that's what you see here. So for the compiler right now, this is not this is just an integer. It's not a U32 yet. I think it stops doing this analysis once it realizes that it wants a borrow, but it does a borrow but can't, and then it just stops figuring out what the integer is supposed to be because it doesn't matter. The borrow is the problem here. So that makes sense too. Cool. Uh, a few ways to do this um, 
to borrowably uh, <laughs> to mutably borrow things or to borrow things because we can of course uh, do the same thing here we could select this text and say print int oh yeah let's pull this up a bit here And I use some IntelliJ function to extract this line into its own uh, function. And IntelliJ sees that this X is mutable, so it just makes this parameter mutable too. But of course, print line doesn't need mutability here because it just reads the value. I just want, so I would assume this doesn't have to be mutable. Let's um, run this. And it's interesting, the, the Rust compiler does not seem to tell you now that it need, doesn't need to be mutable. That's strange. I would expect that. Let's try that again. Okay. So the compiler should be able to tell you that, but it does not. This might be because I use print line here, which is a macro that might be too magical for the compiler to figure that out. I don't know. Um, so with that assumption, I can just remove this mutable, this mutability here, and it prints just fine because obviously prints should not change the thing that they're printing. And it's interesting that this automatically works, right? I don't have to do something like this or remove, remove mutability. Everything that is mutable is also automatically readable. You can read and write to mutable things. You don't only have to write them. And that makes sense. Because if you have one writer, you can only have one reader and you can either read or write. That's just in the nature of the program. And this is why that works automatically, I think. I think. That's my explanation for that. Also, it's very practical and uh, there's not even syntax to easily remove mutability uh, with this. Unmute, Unmute. exactly. <laughs> Umut or something like that. Uh, fortunately, not uh, in this version of Rust. All right, so now we are 40 minutes in and it was all about mutability and immutability and borrowing and mutable borrowing. Uh, these, these borrows here, they're called shared borrows, by the way, because there can be multiple sharing the same address location, whereas this is just called a mutable borrow. And these terms we will use more from now on. Mutable borrow and shared borrow. Or immutable borrow as a as a synonymous thing. Yeah. 40 minutes. I think my my head is uh, smoking. <laughs> Definitely. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and it that... does make sense. Uh, and it does feel safer just looking at this already. Um, it's just, yeah, I can imagine that takes quite a while to get used to and that you'd have to fight this quite a bit in certain places. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing experience helps. Yes. And we try to, we try to gain that, of course. Um, so the plan is in the next sessions to learn a bit more about this ownership stuff because we didn't really dig into ownership yet. We just had borrows, which play into the ownership system uh, quite a bit. And then, of course, as soon as possible, we, we try to experience all this with uh, actual Git Oxide crates, maybe even Git, Git Oxide code. Let's see when we get to that. It already took 40 minutes to get to here, so it can only be a matter of um, weeks and months. Yay. So bear with us as wait. we continue. <laughs> then I'd say that's the end of the session number one. And I thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much. And see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.